good day to each and every one of you. Join me, please, for a brief prayer. Our God and our Father, bless me that my thoughts may align with your thoughts and that I'm able to clearly perceive what you wish to make known to those you are reaching out unto. As an imperfect being, I'm unworthy of speaking for the Lord. However, as one who hath accepted Christ as my Savior, I'm indwelled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I humble myself to the will of the Lord and seek his guidance as I receive this message and share it with those who are slated to hear it. I pray this in the mighty, majestic name of our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. My title for today is Christianity Through the Eyes of Belief. It's all about faith. This episode is to follow a previous message regarding Christianity through the eyes of disbelief. Unbelievers see faith totally different from those who believe in God. But it's important for us to see the contrast between the two, especially for those who seek to fulfill the Great Commission as urged by our Christ Jesus. Currently, he seemed to be pointing me in the direction of leading outsiders of the faith into his fold. And though I'm not an official clergyman, My acceptance of the Lord as my personal Savior qualifies me to at least point to the direction where belief can be found. Through this means, it would not be me, Greg, doing the doing. On the contrary, it would be the Spirit of God that lives within me that does the doing. Scripture says that no one can come to God unless he draws them nearer. This is according to our Lord himself, as written in the epistle of John, chapter 6, verses 44 and 45, which says, quote, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be taught by God. Therefore, Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Let's quote. We all come to Christ to be taught as Christian believers. As I indicated in my title, this is all about Christianity looking through the eyes of those who have already found faith through God, specifically through Christ. It's about what God does to bring his faithful into his flock. Now, in my last straight talk, I was talking about Christianity coming from the mindsets of those who have yet to discover God. I made it a point of letting my listeners know that at one point in our lives, we were all unbelievers. In the sense that we have to be taught about God in order to believe. In a similar manner, we must be taught most things in life before we accept it as our measure of living life and having our very beings. The aspect of accepting Christ as Lord is a process within itself. It is not our role to convert anyone to Christ. According to Christ himself in the scriptures in the book of John, it is God that initiates that process for us. We were born into a fallen world, subject to all the elements and forces that come with being here. 
as mortal beings here on earth, we are reliable upon situations and circumstances that were not within our ability to control. We did not have ourselves born, nor did we place ourselves in the stations where we were born into. All of this was done for us by our Creator God through His godly assignments of our immortal souls that are currently living in bodies, in bags of flesh, that in itself is a product of the earth. You eat, breathe, and live off the substance of the earth. Therefore, your body is quite literally of the earth. However, your soul is not. It belongs to God. We are currently living in an imperfect environment, seeking to become what the will of God specifies. Fortunately for us, God is omnipotent. He knows all things from the beginning to the end. He is quite capable and able to assist us from the heavenly realm, knowing just exactly what is about to happen before it happens. This could account for the fact that no one can come to him until he knows that we are ready to receive him. With God, it's not a matter of random luck, but of divine knowledge that he precisely uses to draw us nearer to him. We come into the world as somewhat of a blank slate. Nearly everything about us is imprinted upon us by several opposing forces. The carnal forces does what it does to mold and shape you into the world's image and likeness. But the spirit does what it does to mold and shape you into the likeness and image of God, our creator. Being born in the world, you are subject to such forces. Many times without your awareness, the world would be happy to shape you into sin and unrighteousness if there were no godly forces to guard you. On the other hand, God draws his children to him knowing exactly when they would seek him. The Father provides the Holy Spirit as our helpmate and guide once we come into his Awareness. Now, just becoming aware of God alone does not save or protect you from the dark forces that seek to devour you. As mentioned in 1 Peter, the fifth chapter, 8 and 9, he says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking who he may devour. Resist him! Steadfast in faith, knowing that the same suffering are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. God's word tells us to seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. And all things of God will be provided through that source. This means, should you desire to come into his flock, you are not alone. He sends his heavenly and earthly hosts to your aid that got you into his waiting arms. Let us examine this situation a bit closer. Every Christian is imperfect while living in a mortal body. Everyone was once an unbeliever before something caused them to believe or to at least give belief a chance. God tells us to taste him and see just how good he is. In the book of Psalms, King David wrote, quote, The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. He goes on to say, Oh, taste and see the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. Close quote. Now I want you to imagine who or what God is. God is not a man or a person as we are. 
We were built in the likeness of God, but not from a physical standpoint. We are spirit and God is spirit. Our immortal essence was created in the likeness and the image of God to be like him. That is not true about your mortal bodies. We are living in mortal bodies that will shed away, exposing our immortal souls, eternal, once they are absent the body. God is always working on our immortal soul. That is the eternal part of our existence. Now this happened with each of his immortal souls once they accept Christ as Lord and Savior. He brings the souls into the body of God. This is the function of a Savior. Now does this mean that God shows favoritism? He said that King David was a man of God's own heart. That was because he knew the heart that was in David. Can we all be like David? No. We are one of a kind to the Father. He made us to be special. Can we become people that God loves as he did King David? Absolutely. We were all created just to be objects of God's love and great affection. Our goal should be to become imitators of Christ Jesus. When we are like Christ, we are so loved by the Father as his sons and daughters of the faith. Your heavenly Father wants you to return to him, homeward bound into his kingdom. This is the belief of every Christian servant and their heart's desire. It is not something that they must do alone. Our Father cautions us to lean not upon your own understanding of divine matters, but instead lean upon him who is all knowledgeable of all things. It is he who draws you to him and he that teaches you all things that you currently do not know. Use his divine eyes to guide you as would a sin eye dog for the blind. Those are the eyes that Christ was speaking about when he said, Let those who have eyes see. It is God's eyes that he was referencing, as well as those with ears to hear. Your body becomes a vessel that the Lord uses while you are still here on earth. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit that lives in you? whom you have from God. You are no longer your own, for you were bought at a steep price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You now belong to God, and that body of yours is a holy temple that houses the Holy Spirit. Does that not give you caution? Now, as a believer, you are duty-bound by God, who now owns your being, and he will serve as your guide into his heavenly abode. He says, be still and know that I am God. Let not your feeble mind tell you otherwise, because it is of the world and does not know God. Therefore, As the Apostle Paul cautioned us in the book of Romans, he said, quote, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may Prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Close quote. In other words, let go and let God. He is your caretaker from this point forward and beyond into eternity.
we must take charge over our minds that are of the world and want so desperately to please the world. The mind is actually hostile to God because it does not want to obey him. Romans 8 and 7 says, quote, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. Let's quote. Again, the mind is on the world, not of God. Unfortunately, most people think their minds are who they are. So they give in or obey what their mind leads them to do. This, in my opinion, is where the rubber meets the road. For Christians, one must be aware of who they are through the eyes of God and thereby put the spirit of God over the carnal self so it, the mind, can obey God as God desires. Christians are called to a higher duty once in the body of God. First, they must believe in God and accept him as he exists, in spirit and in truth. God is not a person, so if you're looking to seeking someone to find in a person, you would miss God because you are looking in the wrong places. Although God is everywhere at all times, this is not an embodiment of human flesh, but far, far beyond anything physically formed. Without faith and belief in God, it is impossible to know him or love him. Hebrews 11, 6 says, quote, but without faith it's impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Although through our carnal mindset, this appears to be a conundrum, but for those who have received God in spirit, it is our way of life. We believe, therefore, God is the center of our being, and we obey him. As I was lying in bed contemplating on how to finish this episode, the Spirit gave me an addendum that I found quite revealing. He said unto me, just as you do not see God in a singular physical form being, because God is spirit, you also need not use physical language to hear his communications or revelations. God speaks to us quite clearly in his language that usually has very little to do with language you learn to communicate with other carnal beings. By this measure, you are to be still and know that I am God. Quieten the mind and your physical ears so you may listen through your heart as God speaks openly to you. Just as you should not be looking for something physical to see God, neither should you be listening for something physical to hear Him. Christ used to always tell His followers, let those who have eyes see and let those who have ears to hear. He was speaking of spiritual eyes and ears that go far beyond anything that is carnal. So, here's my final verdict. Without belief, there appears to be no God because if you do not believe in him as he exists, to the unbeliever, he doesn't exist. Even though unbelief does not eradicate God, it only blinds the unbeliever of what is spirit and truth. God is I am that I am. There is nothing carnal beings can do to erase God, who, by the way, created even the unbelievers. They only shut the doorway into heaven from themselves. On the other hand, Christian believers who have accepted Christ as Lord and Savior 
reap the benefits of everything God promised to his faithful. Look at him. I say this as one who was once an unbeliever until something God did to draw me near to him so he could teach me. It is not something that we do other than believe by faith and allow God to do the rest for us. In essence, once we accept Christ as Lord, the rest is up to him to prepare us for the Father. Now, this is Christianity through the eyes of those who believe. And oh, what a joy it is to Almighty God be the glory. See you.